And we're back on Consumer Choice Radio coming to you on the Big Talker 106.7 FM out of Wilmington, North Carolina, and Saga 960 in the Peel region uh, of Ontario. Um, it is with great pleasure that I get to, get to introduce our guest for this week's program. Uh, he is a cardiothoracic surgeon by trade and has represented Indiana's 8th District since 2011. Welcome to the show, Congressman Larry Bouchon. Well, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, it's it's obviously been uh, a pretty wild time uh, in Congress. Uh, it feels like the infrastructure bill um, was the bill that was kind of forever debated, and now it uh, looks like it is behind us. But I just wanted to get your your take on the infrastructure bill Um has spending gone too far? Is there pork in this that does that maybe needs to be removed? Um, and so, if you could just explain to our listeners where you where you view the infrastructure bill uh, in terms of its current standing. Well, let me just say this: there's a lot of positive things in the infrastructure bill. I think that in a bipartisan way, we all know we need roads, bridges, rural broadband for areas like I re- I represent in Indiana. Um, you know, our airports need some help, transit in the cities, all those things are positive. But then there's a lot of things in there, I think, that are probably uh, too, much, too much spending. The CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, said it's going to add roughly $260 billion to the deficit, which means that it's not paid for. So there's a lot of things I think Republicans think are probably at this point not ready for prime time. A lot of the charging stations for electric cars and all kinds of things that we see as handouts to the Democrats' uh, political friends. But the reality is, is that it passed through the Senate and it passed through the House. I was disappointed with my 13 Republican colleagues because I think if they had not voted for it, I think we could have actually got a better infrastructure deal. I want an infrastructure deal. But uh, overall, there's a lot of positive things in there. But I do think there's going to be a lot of wasteful spending that uh, we probably Yes, and hopefully uh, Congress will be able to track that as well. I know that was a big thing in 2009 after Barack Obama's uh, big plan. There's a lot of tracking, hopefully some hearings. We can see where some of this money is going. I wanted to change gears um, a little bit on this um, because, you know, we had the the squabbles in Congress and we've got a lot of things that are happening in the White House and throughout the different agencies. Uh, But one thing where you have been very clear and as a medical doctor, you have uh, been very forward in saying that vaccination is important. Uh, however, you do have some qualms about President uh, Joe Biden's vaccine mandate. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, a- as you mentioned, as a physician, I think uh, the data shows the vaccine's safe and effective. Even if you get a breakthrough case and you've been vaccinated, the data shows you don't end up in the ICU, and it's very, very rare to have a death related to a vaccinated individual. That said, uh, a federal mandate is a bridge too far. The federal government should not be mandating that U.S. citizens get a medical treatment uh, if they don't want that treatment. And that's what this is. Don't you know, it is a vaccination. Yes, I understand that uh, there are people frustrated with the low level of vaccination in certain areas of the country. But the federal government should not be mandating any medical treatment if the person doesn't want it. Um, You know, it's not on us at the federal level to decide what's good for you. It's you and your doctor. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's an an important perspective, and I, I mean, we've already seen some private companies sort this out for themselves. Um, some of them have have decided, and I think it's it's probably appropriate in some instances. Like if you're in a meat packing plant, where we saw so many outbreaks, um, especially throughout um, late last year, it may may be appropriate. But then at the same time, it it does leave me scratching my head, where it's like, well. If you work at a golf course on the grounds crew, I, I mean, yeah, it would be great if you got the vaccine in terms of my own personal personal opinion, but I'm not sure how, what the what is the efficacy of making some outdoor worker, uh, if he happens to work at a large company, get the vaccine? And it's like, we may be, if we, we, we may be missing that kind of nuance in the discussion here. Yeah, I would agree with that. The other thing is, is the federal employee and federal contractor part of this. I mean, I think the federal government has a little more uh, leeway there, but let me just tell you, in my district, I have a federal prison. It's the supermax for the United States, Terre Haute, Indiana. 
they have about a 46% vaccination rate amongst their employees. They're on their pathway to being terminated. Uh, what are we going to do with the workforce in that situation? You know, are we really going to terminate these people if they don't want to get a vaccine? And here's the kicker. The inmates don't have to get vaccinated. So there's a lot of things in there that need to be addressed. Uh, if the private sector companies want to mandate their, vac their employees get vaccinated, that's their decision. But the federal government should not be mandating medical treatments. And and on the on the medical side, this is this is a bit of a different subject, but it's something that Yaela and I have talked about. Um, so John Oliver, the late night show host, had a very long rant about the need basically to ban all PFAS chemicals, otherwise known as man-made chemicals. And I'd done some digging on this and looked at where these were used in areas where I mean, obviously, it's terrible and it's bad for human health if it's being dumped into waterways and, and really nefarious things like that. But there are some legitimate uses. And I came across your comment on this matter in regards to medical equipment. And so what is your take on where there may be utility in regards to these man-made chemicals? Well, first of all, there's thousands of them, as you know. And so each one is potentially different. There are a lot. They're very toxic and have contaminated groundwater, and we need to address that. In the medical field, there's a substance called polytetrafluoroethylene, uh, or Gore-Tex, you know, and that is used in vascular grafts and patches really for decades very safely, and it's been shown to be safe uh, when implanted into humans and really shouldn't be included in this type of a ban. Uh, you know, the Gore-Tex also in your jackets and your uh, gloves and all those things, same compound. Um, and it's been shown as long as it's not heated up to a certain high level of temperature, uh, it's not dangerous. It doesn't cause any problems at all. So this is going to be very detrimental to the medical industry if it's banned. It's used in all kinds of devices, uh, medical, vascular grafts, and patches. And wh what do you think the... What do you think the just like, why is it that some of the folks on the other side seem to have such a huge blind spot here? Because it's one of those things where I think we, everybody can agree that groundwater and a clean water approach is, is definitely the way to go. And yet when I hear from folks on the other side of this debate, they just seem like they don't care uh, in regards to what these externalities are. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, have you experienced that in Congress? Yeah, I think what happened is at the committee level, the Energy and Commerce Committee, my, the committee I'm on, is they just didn't want any amendments to their bill. They wanted to get it through the, the House. Uh, but I think reasonable uh, people will prevail on this. I think when people realize you real, that some of these compounds really uh, are safe and they're used for all kinds of things, uh, if you really, I don't have, really look at what PFAS are used in, you'd be surprised, and you probably have done that. Uh, and your your listeners and viewers should also. But I think co cooler heads will prevail. They just didn't want any amendments to their bill in the House. They wanted to get it through. But you see, the Senate hasn't acted on it. And the reason is, is because there's going to be some substantial changes and probably some PFAS compounds, which are going to be exempted from this ban. You're listening to Consumer Choice Radio, by the way. We're, we're talking to Congressman Larry Bouchon from Indiana, medical doctor, uh, He's actually been a hero on many different medical topics. And uh, if we could switch that a little bit, uh, Congressman, because I know that one thing that you've definitely been forefront uh, in pursuing is hospital and medical transparency. And there are a lot of questions about our healthcare system, about how much things cost, the role of insurance. Uh, what, what are some of the efforts that you've spearheaded and led in Congress in really trying to make sure that our medical bills can be lower as Americans? Well, the, the number one thing in the healthcare system is it's not a true free market. And, you know, there's no what I'll call consumerism. For the most part, consumers uh, don't have the ability to drive down prices in the healthcare system in general. Now, it works in things like LASIK eye surgery, where it's paid for by you and the consumer can drive the price. And that's happened. You saw over the last 15 years, the LASIK eye surgery. The cost has gone way down. The doctors are better. The equipment's better, but it's less costly. The regular healthcare system, because of the third-party payer system, doesn't have that. There's a disconnect between the patient and the payer. And so, honestly, there's no, no incentive for the healthcare system at large to control the cost. And so, I, what I've been trying to do is help get more quality information 
on what quality care you're getting and more data on pricing to the consumer. And that's very difficult because, because let me tell you, the healthcare system at large really doesn't want you to know because, uh, and I've been part of the system for 30 years, but that's what I'm working on. I mean, all kind, there's all kinds of things you can do. Uh, the Trump administration wanted the hospitals to produce their price listing. It's been done, but it's in, in a complicated way that the consumer can't understand. The only way to get healthcare costs down is the consumers have to get involved and drive it and demand lower prices and better quality. And honestly, at the federal level, it's been frustrating. Well, we, yeah, we, we do love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think there was, um, it was either in Oklahoma or Alabama, and it was some surgical clinic. And you can actually go on their website and you can see what a hernia surgery costs or what an ACL tear repair costs. And from my view, I was like, well, that's kind of refreshing. Uh, one, one because it lets you know right off the bat and it helps you avoid some of those horror stories where someone's like, oh, I broke my arm and I got a $50,000 bill because they charged me eight grand for one of the screws. Um, but also, I mean, in so many other areas of the American economy, people are able to protest with their feet and with their wallet and say, this is, this, is, this is not a good price, that this is not the service I want. And that seems to be really missing from the healthcare debate um, and almost gets left by the wayside, I think, when you have the larger macro debate of does the government pay for everything, socialized care, all of that. And it's like, well, why don't we insert some competition and have some 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 back and forth there in regards to price and then we could should probably have a, a discussion about the role of government but let's at least make things open and competitive first um, i would agree with you totally on that and the healthcare system at large doesn't want that really i've fought this battle i mean um, again there's a disconnect between the consumer and who pays the bill and in, in most cases and when you have that honestly most people don't really care what the overall cost is, they want to know what their out-of-pocket cost is. We all need to be concerned about what the overall cost is. Hey, what's our insurance company paying for this? Because if we're not concerned about that, we can't get the, the price down. And we've done some anti-competitive things. There's a moratorium on physician-owned hospitals, for example. You can debate that, whether that's good or bad, but the correct reality is they've been shown to create competition in marketplace and help drive down costs. So, and their quality is good. So, yeah, the system at large is very frustrating. And, uh, you know, I have in 10 years, haven't made a big dent, but I've been trying. Wow, we need more consumer champions like that. So I like that. Uh, Congressman, in, in our last uh, minute and a half here, uh, what are some of the other topics and things that you'll be trying to push through the Congress? I know there's, uh, there's a lot of games that are played with whips and votes and all the rest. Uh, but what are some of the top topics, perhaps any that we didn't mention, uh, that you want to try to focus on in Congress here the next few months? Well, on the medical side, there's a cliff coming at the end of the year on reimbursement cuts to providers of 3.75%. Um, that is kind of a reimbursement snafu from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That's a big deal. It's going to hurt access. Also, the sequester cuts for medical people will be hitting. Uh, so right now, before the end of the year, I'm working on mitigating ways to make sure that the providers out there across the spectrum, whether that's physical therapists, whether that's physicians, whether it's hospitals, are properly paid by CMS for their services. Because if they're not, what they do is eliminate services and it limits access to seniors. So that's one of the big things I'm working on. We're obviously going to have to fund the government uh, and deal with the debt ceiling. It's going to be up to the Democrats to raise the debt ceiling. But we do need to fund the government in a fiscally responsible way. And, you know, since I've been in Congress for 10 years, it, we don't properly fund the government every year. We do all these extensions, and that's a big frustration because the budget process is really broken, uh, and both parties need to fix it. So those are the be big things before the end of the year, I think. Beautiful. Well, you heard it here. Uh, it was great to hear from Congressman Larry Bouchon from Indiana, giving us uh, all the specs on his thoughts of the day. Congressman, thanks so much for coming on Consumer Choice Radio. Thanks for having me anytime. <laughs>